Hey guys, it's Elizabeth. Hmm. Hey guys, it's Elizabeth of ERWplans.com. Obviously today's a little different because you're seeing my face, um, which is not something we usually do on here. Uh, and that's because I want to do something special for October. Uh, October is my birth month, which makes it my favorite month. And it also contains my favorite holiday, which is Halloween. So I wanted to do something a little bit different for the plan with me this month. Um, I love doing a few things, planning, of course, and also watching true crime and listening to true crime on podcasts and just reading true crime books. And I'm kind of an obsessive true crime person. Like when I was growing up, there were actually serial killer trading cards and I collected some of them because I'm true crime obsessed and have been since before it was called informative murder porn on South Park. So I decided I wanted to do something a little different. And for this plan with me, instead of telling you what I'm doing, because I've done two dozen plan with me's at this point in my uh, YouTube career. And, you know, I've explained everything I'm doing, plus all the mini videos, which you can see on Patreon. Um, you just know my methods by now. But what you might not know is my love of true crime. And so I figure I'll do a plan with me, but instead of explaining what I'm doing, I'm just gonna tell you a spooky true crime story for Halloween. So if you like it, this is something brand new. I've never done it before. So if you do like this, please leave a comment below and let me know. And if you guys really enjoy this, and I'm gonna do at least three or four this month, if you really enjoy it, I'll do more. So, um, you know, let me know. Um, and if you don't, also let me know. And this, these will be the only ones you ever see. Okay, it's a little bit of an experiment here to see how you guys feel about planning and true crime. So with that said, uh, my glasses keep slipping off my face because like I said, I don't do face to camera very often. Don't really know what I'm doing quite yet. I'll get it worked out by the last of these. Um, with that said, let's jump into today's story before we get planning. Um, just a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, uh, I, everything that I use in the planner, I'm not going to talk about while I'm planning, obviously, because I'm telling a story, but you are super welcome to check out the description and that will show you all of the things that I used when doing my planner today. It will also have a link to all of the sources for researching this story. So if you want to learn more, all the info is in the description of the video. Uh, and with that being said, one last thought. Um, if you enjoyed the video, like I said, let me know below. Also, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, so that way you'll get notified. Also hit the notifications button so that as soon as I go live or post another story, you'll get an email or a notification in YouTube letting you know. And of course, like, share with friends, as always. Now, We'll get into today's story. This story is, I'm going to start with this story for this series because it's one that I want to say close to my heart, if, if that makes sense. Um, a little background about me. I graduated high school in 1999 and it took me a while to get done college. I went one semester on, one semester off. Uh, I've discussed this in some videos and some blog posts before, but I have uh, major depressive disorder and ADHD. And so how that works out is in college, I would do 21 credits in a semester and burn myself out completely and then have to like cocoon for six months to a year to recover. And then I'd go in full force. Oh my God, I'm going to do all 21 credits again. And so it took me eight years instead of four to do a four year degree. I went to a couple different colleges, one of them being where I graduated from Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I uh, also knew quite a few people from my high school that went to Trenton State, uh, now known as TCNJ. I think technically it already was TCNJ at the time my friends and I were going to school in the area, but we all knew it as Trenton State. When I was on the high school diving team, we did our diving practice at Trenton State, so it's just I will use Trenton State and TCNJ interchangeably. It's the same school, okay? 
But I, so I know a lot of people on campus, uh, it's 30 minutes away from Rutgers if you drive as a crazy bitch like I do. So 45 minutes if you drive like a normal human being. And so I knew people on campus and I spent a lot of time in Trenton State, went to a lot of parties. Um, my husband even graduated from Trenton State. So uh, like I said, I, I knew a lot of people up there and spent a lot of time up there. And during the years I was going to Rutgers, this case occurred. So it was very much fresh on my mind, on the mind of people I knew at Trenton State. And it also was something that's close to me as someone from South Jersey, because the subject of our story is also from South Jersey, a Philly sports fan like me. And like I said, someone that went to a school that I'm very familiar with. So I followed this case very closely and I, I it seemed it's, it's also very eerie because it's unsolved. And so I wanted to start my true crime uh, vlogging career, if you will, with a case that I am very familiar with that's very, very close to my heart. And uh, also that doesn't get a lot of uh, media attention. And I feel like I look every time there's like a new true crime show on TV, I look and because there's so many more questions than there are answers and only theories, no resolutions to what happened. There's just not a lot on there. I still, I feel like if um, Investigation Discoveries disappeared was still on, this would be a perfect case for them. Um, but it's not still on the air, not doing new episodes. Investigation Discovery. If you can hear me, please restart Disappeared and please feature the case of John Fiacco. John Fiacco was a 19-year-old student at the College of New Jersey studying graphic arts. He was a Philadelphia sports team fan. He enjoyed drawing, especially comic book heroes like Batman and Spider-Man, as well as listening to Green Day, watching professional wrestling, and playing football. He was even the track team captain in high school. A somewhat shy, artistic guy until you got to know him. John was close to his three younger siblings and his parents, especially his mom, Susan, who said her son had a passing resemblance to the singer George Michael. He was described by friends as probably the most chill guy you'll ever meet. For his freshman year at TCNJ, 2005 to 2006, John was staying on campus in a room on the fourth floor of TCNJ's Wolf Hall. On March 25th, 2006, John and a few friends had decided to drink some beer in their dorm room early in the evening before heading out to a party at the track house, an off-campus house where some members of the track team lived. John and his friends continued drinking until around midnight at the track house and then headed back to campus. Once they were back in Wolf Hall on the fourth floor, the group continued drinking. His friends remember John being drunk, but not incredibly intoxicated, according to what they remember. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Around 2 a.m. on the morning of Saturday, March 26th, John left the group and went down to the empty room of a girl named Jane. Their relationship status was best described as, it's complicated. John was very interested in Jane, but Jane was currently seeing someone else and by most accounts just thought of him as just a friend. They still had sleepovers. I guess you could say they were like cuddle buddies. Um, so it was not unusual for him to spend the night in her room. Sometime between 2.45 and 3 a.m. on Saturday, March 26th, an unnamed friend of John later reported walking past Jane's room, seeing the door open, looking inside, and seeing John asleep. The friend did John a solid and closed the door behind him. That was the last person to ever see John Fiacco. Around 10.45 the next morning, Jane's roommate came back and found the bed quote, partially unmade. 
It had been slept in, but it was now empty. John's sneakers were on the floor beside the bed, which, again, not super unusual. So the roommate, not too worried. John's friends, however, had noticed that he, you know, didn't come down to the hall all day to eat. And they began just calling his cell phone. And eventually the call started going straight to voicemail. His friends began checking in with each other, asking about John's whereabouts, and no one had seen him since 2 a.m. By noon, his friends were getting a really bad feeling about this. And his roommate, Matt, finally decided around 3 p.m. on Saturday afternoon to report John missing. But campus cops told him, no, dude, you got to wait 24 hours. Cannot report him missing. Six hours later, at 9.30 that evening, someone finally notified John's parents uh, to say, hey, we haven't seen John in like 18 hours. You know what's up with that? John's family panicked, as one would do, and called the campus police. And they were also told, no, sorry, dude, you got to wait 24 hours. And a parent's going to have to come down in person to sign this report. They're not going to take a student's report on this. So at 9 a.m. on Sunday, March 27th, well after 24 hours have passed, John's mom went to TCNJ's campus and filed a missing persons report with the campus cops. Campus PD told her, no big deal. Completely not unusual for college students to like disappear and reappear, you know, whatever. He'll be back in a day or two. But they did take the report and they supposedly began searching. By 3 a.m. Monday, 48 hours after John had last been seen by friends, there was still no sign of him. Around 12 hours later, on Monday, the 28th of March, the campus police called in the New Jersey State Police and transferred the case. The New Jersey State Police actually began investigating They did a massive search of the campus, and eventually their search brought them to the basement of Wolf Hall, to the trash compactor room. And that's where they noticed some blood. What they called a significant volume of blood. And a large amount of blood-soaked debris under, around, and inside the trash compactor. The blood was sampled and sent off for forensic analysis. Later, it was confirmed that that blood did belong to John Fiacco. They also located a necklace in the room that belonged to John Fiacco. Later, investigators learned that around 9 a.m. on Monday, March 28th, around the same time that John's parents were reporting him missing, Building services workers were doing routine emptying of the dumpsters. When they got to Wolf Hall, a worker noticed a red liquid leaking out of the trash bin. The other worker joked, don't slip on that blood. (laughs) Lol. They weren't aware that there was a missing student, as the officers were in the process of taking the report at the time, because, oh, you gotta wait 24 hours, dudes. And since they weren't aware of the missing student, and since students throw weird shit away all the time, they never reported that missing red liquid to the campus police, thus delaying the discovery of the blood by a good six hours. Once the blood has been discovered, the investigation shifts to where the dumpster contents went after it was loaded into the trash truck. Two landfills across state lines in Pennsylvania. Now, despite being only about six hours behind the removal of the trash from the trash compactor, give or take, the search for John's body across those landfills would take weeks. Over 35 law enforcement agents, state and local, from two states, as well as workers from the landfill and the sanitation department, 
sifted through approximately 3,500 tons of debris. The day before the search was officially supposed to end, on April 25th, 2006, one month after John was last seen alive, the mangled and badly decomposed body of John Fiacco was found. Autopsy results, as reported in local media, would later reveal that the injuries that John sustained were consistent with, quote, being processed by a trash disposal system, end quote. And the body was largely intact. They would not or could not say whether John was alive or deceased when he entered the trash compactor. The full result of the autopsy, including injuries sustained and toxicology results, has never been made public by law enforcement. Now, the question for investigators at this point was, how did John Fiacco end up in that trash compactor? And why was he there in the first place? Officials spoke with over a thousand students and workers at Trenton State, and they interviewed 150 friends, family members, and close associates but they were unable to identify a person of interest or suspect. Now, there were a lot of theories. Some students, a large number of students, in fact, said it was a drug deal gone wrong, though friends and family who knew John insist that the only drug he ever touched was alcohol. Others insisted that it was a drug deal, but that John had inadvertently stumbled into the drug deal, you know, after he was asleep at 3 a.m., but before the roommate came back at 10 a.m., and that the drug dealer had, you know, murdered him to keep him quiet. People pointed out that the trash chute from the fourth floor to the trash compactor was known to be incredibly noisy. So if a group of people had been shoving his body in the chute, students said, it was unlikely anyone would have heard him or noticed. However, law enforcement did take a camera down the chute, and no blood evidence or trace blood evidence was discovered in the fourth floor trash chute. In 2011, the family of John Fiacco floated their own theory of murder, alleging that a mentally ill former graduate of Trenton State, who's never been formally identified, so I'm just going to call him Steve, told multiple people that he'd murdered John. The family alleges that Steve suffers from bipolar disorder, stopped taking his medications, and had a manic episode. They allege that during these episodes, Steve was known to leave his home in the middle of the night and wander the Trenton State campus. It's alleged that on the night of March 25th, 2006, Steve snuck into Wolf Hall, murdered John Fiacco, and shoved his body down the trash chute all by himself. According to Fiacco's family, Steve was involuntarily committed to the psychiatric hospital two days after John went missing, which is... Okay, it's a little strange of a coincidence, a little sus, but officers have stated that Steve was interviewed during their investigation. They've provided no details publicly regarding Steve's statements, but again, reiterate, they have no person or persons of interest, and there are no suspects. Now, I have some problems with this theory. First... John Fiacco is an athletic guy, as we mentioned before. He weighed somewhere between 175 to 180 pounds at the time of his death. So it seems improbable that someone who wasn't an athlete, like Steve, would be able to single-handedly move John from Jane's room to the trash chute, which is about two feet by two feet in size, and squeeze John down the chute into the basement all by himself. It also seems improbable that a single person, like Steve, would be able to carry a 175 to 180 pound man down four flights of stairs in a dorm room building into the basement, either firefighter firefighter style or, you know, two hand carry like a little baby. And no one's going to notice and think that's weird. Like one person doesn't usually carry the limp body of a second person around with them. Moreover. Let's talk about this mental illness stigma here. Just because someone is bipolar and off their medication and having a manic episode doesn't make them a killer. People in manic episodes 
aren't necessarily violent. Just like a person who's schizophrenic is not necessarily violent just because of their illness. A person who has a psychiatric disorder, such as bipolar disorder, may suffer from delusions and hallucinations. They may even suffer from ideas of grandeur. So they exaggerate involvement in events that they're not involved in. They basically just lie to make themselves more important. Honestly, I understand why John's family has leaned into this Steve theory. I really do. It has got to be a slightly less discomforting thought to believe that your loved one was at the very least deceased when they were mangled by a trash compactor, as opposed to the alternative. So I, my heart goes out to them, and I understand why you would really want to believe he was already gone before he went into the trash bin. And it's still possible. I'm just not convinced that Steve murdered someone all by himself. Now, there are even more theories. Even the writer Joyce Carol Oates has her own theory. Six months after the death of John Fiacco, Oates published a story in The New Yorker called Landfill, in which a thinly veiled character who's basically John Fiacco, goes drinking, is verbally assaulted by a group of stereotypical misogynist jock types, and then is thrown down a trash chute after engaging with some bullies. The character is a freshman in college, is murdered in March, and the story begins with the character's body being discovered in a landfill. Now, Oates at first denied that this story was in any way related to John Fiacco, which, I mean, really, Queen? (laughs) How dumb do you think we are? She later admitted, okay, some artistic inspiration may have come from the new story that, you know, happened six months before publication. And she released a statement, a faux-pology, if you will, saying, a literary principle is not a justification for upsetting anyone, even unintentionally. I don't think that's how she actually sounds, by the way. But, um, yeah, what? Regardless of the fact that her statement, that it was just a work of fiction, and she didn't mean to hurt anybody, and she's real sorry that your feelings were upset by her work, media reports soon began including the bullying theory as the prevailing theory, even though it's not. (laughs) We don't know what the prevailing theory of the case is, according to the police. They're being pretty tight-lipped about it. Something that was initially not made public is the fact that the trash compactor is not a push-button trash compactor. The dumpster has a motion-activated compactor component. So there doesn't have to be anyone else involved. If John had, for some reason, crawled into the trash chute and fell four stories to the compactor below, or if he'd climbed directly into the trash bin for God knows what reason... The trash compactor would have sensed the motion and automatically started. There didn't need to be anyone else involved. It could have been a tragic accident. Uh, This started a rumor, because colleges and rumors, uh, that investigators were chasing leads about a late night game of hide and seek. You know, for all the times that college kids play hide and seek. Investigators have never disclosed this publicly. No one has ever reported speaking to investigators about a late night game of hide and seek. And no one in the hall recalls playing hide and seek that night. Because of course not. Another theory is that he may have decided to commit suicide via trash compactor. Even though no one knew about the trash compactor automatically turning on at the time and... I never would have thought of committing suicide that way, and I have major depressive disorder, so I think about suicide a lot. Now, John's necklace was located in the trash compactor room, not in the trash or on his body. 
this got some people thinking and a new theory emerged had john tried to give the necklace to jane but jane was like uh no dude what part of just friends do you not understand and then feeling rejected he threw away the necklace and then went ah crap i love that necklace i need to go get that so he chucks it down the chute goes oh shit goes running down stairs and jumps in the trash bin doesn't realize that the trash compactor automatically triggers could this have happened it's possible now it's important to note here that there has never been any evidence presented by law enforcement to the public to support any of these theories officers have stated again no suspects they have been tight-lipped about their theory of the case the death of john fiacco remains an open investigation in 2008, the Fiaco family filed a $5 million wrongful death lawsuit against Trenton State. They alleged gross negligence. They said that open access to the dorm 16 hours per day, um, people failing to be forced to sign in during the remaining eight hours a day that you had to sign in, uh, failure to lock the trash compactor room or the trash bin itself, and the fact that the front desk... Um, sorry, the fact that I, the door into Wolf Hall had been propped open by an unknown student for an hour and a half after Fiacco was last seen contributed to his death. In 2012, the lawsuit was settled for 10% of the asking amount, $425,000, without a finding or admission of wrongdoing by, or liability by Trenton State. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, I graduated high school in 1999. I graduated college in 2008. I went to Ryder for a semester. I graduated from, ended up graduating from Rutgers. Uh, starting my senior year of high school, I partied at Trenton State a lot. <laughs> like a lot. Um, I can tell you that there are some really good points that the family has. The sign-in desk was a joke. You could pretty much just crawl by. They did not look. Um, I think I signed in one time when I was in college already at the sign-in desk at the uh, dorm hall where my friend was staying. Uh, otherwise, when I was still in high school and showing up to the college campus, I would walk around to the side door and wait for somebody to let me in. So I think they have a point about the front desk not being very secure. I mean, when I was at Ryder, we had swipe cards to swipe in and out of the automatically locking buildings and the buildings were locked 24 hours a day. So, sure, someone could, like, tailgate you in or someone could hold the door open for you. But for the most part, you know, the school did their due diligence. But also, like I said, people just let me into the side or the emergency exit doors at Trenton State Buildings. Because if there is one thing that's certain in this world other than death taxes and data loss, it's that if you tell a college kid don't do something, all they're going to focus on is doing it. Okay, <laughs> so um, I get that the building should definitely be more secure. And I totally believe those trash bins should have been locked, or at least the room should have been locked so no one could get down there. But the propped open door, uh, nah, that's, nah, that's just going to happen no matter where your kid goes to school. I'm sorry, that's, so I don't know. You know, I, I, their lawsuit has some merit, but... It doesn't matter because it's been settled with no admission of wrongdoing. But could Trenton State be doing more? Because John Fiaco was not the first student to mysteriously die on their campus. <laughs> uh -uh. Nope. Uh, in 1977, Sigrid Stevenson was an undergraduate studying music performance at Trenton State. Uh, she liked to sneak into the buildings to practice piano after hours. Because again, college student, tell them don't do something, they're going to go fucking do it. Originally from California, Sigrid was a free spirit, kind of a hippie flower child who was born like 10 years too late to really be a part of the movement. But she still had that free lifestyle. She hitchhiked around the U.S. and Canada until she was in her 20s before deciding, I'm going to go enroll in college and be 
become a music teacher. Um, on September 4th, 1977, a college police officer noticed a bicycle outside of the supposedly closed and locked auditorium at Trenton State and went inside to investigate. Inside, he found the fully nude body of Sigrid Stevenson draped in the canvas piano cover. She'd been bludgeoned to death on the stage, most likely while she was sitting at the piano. It was reported at the time the beating was so savage she was unrecognizable to anyone and had to be identified by friends by her hairstyle and color. Now, she was found nude, but an autopsy later determined she was not sexually assaulted. And more interestingly, her clothing was found folded neatly nearby, as if it was taken off and placed there by Sigrid. There was no tears, you know, no stretch marks on the clothes, and there was no blood. Given her free-spirited nature... Some theorize that she was practicing piano nude, which, well, that's a choice. And in the course of her playing, someone snuck up on her and murdered her. Hundreds of people were interviewed, including a firefighter she'd been living with but was not romantically involved with. You know, like John and Jane. And they interviewed a professor with whom she was particularly close but not romantically involved also. Thank goodness. And they came up with nothing. She had no significant other at the time. So they kind of hit a wall. No person of interest or suspect was ever named, much like John's case. And no arrests were ever made, much like John. Her murder remained an unsolved mystery. Now, it has been said that the most likely suspect in this case was a current student at Trenton State who had allegedly been known to follow her. It's theorized he was rejected by Sigrid, became angry, stalked her to the auditorium, and murdered her while she practiced. Because Steve, who is unnamed, is allegedly a older graduate of Trenton State, some have even tried to connect John and Sigrid's cases. I mean, there are some definite coincidental things for them both. Uh, but some have tried to say that, suggest that maybe Steve was the student who killed Sigrid and then 30 years later murdered John. I mean, I don't buy it. Incredibly implausible, but you know, not impossible, right? Okay. I have my own theory about the case that we're going to discuss at length. But first, some disclosures. I have two day jobs. One is a photographer and one is a research assistant for a forensic toxicology company. So when a case involves heavy drinking and everyone was drinking in this case, my mind immediately goes to the toxicology or lack thereof. Since there's no toxicology report that has been made available in this case, everything that I'm going to say next is based on the witness statements from the night John disappeared. And remember, everyone was drunk. So uh, caveat there. Another caveat is that much like when you have a hammer and everything you see is a nail, when you work in forensics and you see a true crime show or a true crime case, everything is colored by the forensics that you specialize in. So bear that in mind. Now, for the rest of this, video, I'm going to be literally taking on and putting off a forensic toxicology hat because we're going to talk about, at length, the most common mind-altering drug used and abused in the United States. Alcohol. There's a lot of types of alcohol. You may have heard of them. You may have some in your bathroom cabinet. Ethyl alcohol, also known as ethanol, is the kind of alcohol you drink. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. Uh, The effect of it is proportional to the amount that you have consumed and the amount that's in your blood. There have been numerous studies over the years on the effects of blood of alcohol in proportion to the amount of blood. And Dr. Kurt Dabowski has classified these effects into seven stages according to the severity. From the subclinical stage with a BAC blood alcohol content of 0.01 through 0.05 to the final stage of a 0.45 BAC 
or buff, where he says, quote, death from respiratory arrest is basically inevitable, end quote. Around a BAC of 0.03 to 0.12, the euphoria stage, information processing becomes a lot slower and your inhibitions become quite decreased. And when you get to the excitement stage, starting at about a 0.09, your ability to understand what you're doing or that what you're doing has consequences becomes impaired and becomes more impaired in proportion to the alcohol in your blood. As one gets higher, you get less able to understand consequences. Uh, an individual who is an experienced drinker, you know, not your first time at the road, you know, may appear less impaired to an untrained eye and may even be able to complete simple tasks or routine daily tasks, not complex tasks like driving, but simple things, you know, like tying your shoes without issue. It's difficult for someone who's not trained to recognize these signs, you know, like a freshman in college, to distinguish whether an individual is actually impaired and to what degree of impairment. When I was in college, story time, uh, a friend of mine unfortunately lost her roommate to alcohol poisoning. Her friend came home from a party, passed out on the sofa of their apartment, and just never woke up. My friend reported to the police that her friend made noises, moved around, you know, she didn't vomit, didn't seem to be in distress. She just sounded like she was snoring when she got home. There have been numerous incidents over the years at other colleges, including Ryder, where I went briefly, where students, 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 students during hazing rituals are compelled by other students to consume huge quantities of alcohol in a really short amount of time. They pass out and die of alcohol poisoning. Now, my friend was sober when she found her roommate dead and called 911, right thing to do. But more often, other underage drinkers finding a fellow student unconscious from alcohol poisoning delay that call to 911 to cover their own drinking, or they never call at all. Instead, they're more likely to attempt to drive the person to the hospital and dump them off in front of the ER or move a dead body to a location that hopefully someone will discover than they are to take the appropriate actions due to, again, impaired judgment, impaired understanding of consequences to their actions, and a concern for their own safety that outweighs anything else. Something important to understand when the next part that we're going to talk about is how your body deals with drugs and alcohol. When you eat or drink a drug, such as alcohol, uh, there are four th phases that the alcohol goes through. Absorption into your bloodstream, distribution throughout the body via the bloodstream, metabolization of the drug in the body, and elimination from the body, urine, sweat, saliva, any way that it can get the drug out, it's getting it out. Fun fact about alcohol, it's eliminated from the body at a consistent rate until the very long tail end when it gets a little wibbly wobbly. Because of that, there is this very fancy algebraic equation called the Widmark equation, where you can take five of the following six pieces of information, weight, number of drinks, type of alcohol, blood alcohol content, rate of elimination from the body or the time between the first and last drink and algebraically determine the sixth piece of information that you don't have. In this case, I'm missing a bunch of information. I don't know what John was drinking. I don't know how frequently he was drinking. I don't know what his BAC is. So we're going to make some educated guess guesses based on, again, remember, drunk people's testimony. All told, depending on what alcohol was consumed, how much, how frequently, a rough calculation says John could have conservatively been a 0.12, not overly drunk, but still too drunk to be aware of consequences um, or any good decision-making skills, up to a 0.35 or higher. The low-end estimate works well with that disposed necklace theory we talked about earlier, 
the ne- necklace being lightweight would have been thrown down the chute and it would have bounced off the trash bin onto the floor. John, experiencing emotional lability, has a change of heart. Oh, crap, I'm not mad anymore. Now I'm upset. Runs to the basement to try to retrieve it. Jumps into the bin, too drunk to realize what is happening to him. At that higher end, he would have been somewhere between the stupor, coma, or inevitable death stages of alcohol consumption and would have experienced respiratory or cardiac failure. Now, these are extremely rough calculations. I have used the standard drink, which is 12 ounces of 4.5 alcohol by volume, ABV beer, 5 ounces of an 8% ABV wine, or 1.5 ounces of a 40% ABV denatured spirit, aka hard liquor, and a rate of between one to two drinks per hour, which is pretty average for a college student. And I used the elimination average for a human being of a 0.015 per hour. Now, these are all just averages. Numbers would only go up if John had consumed beers that were higher ABV. Uh, beverages such as a mixed drink that had multiple shots per drink. Or if he was consuming more than one standard drink per hour. In total... My personal theory of the case, based on all of that information that I just dumped on you, is that on the morning of March 26, 2006, John Fiacco died from alcohol poisoning. He'd been drinking extensively the previous night into the morning, by all accounts, at least through 2 a.m. It's my theory that John went to Jane's room, removed his sneakers, passed out in bed, and just didn't wake up. The last person to allegedly see him alive, his unnamed friend who saw him in Jane's bed through the open door, did not state that they went into the room. And it's hard to see into a dark, unlit room from an open, lit hallway. So they wouldn't really be able to tell if John was asleep, unconscious in shallow breathing, or possibly even dead. To me, the most likely scenario is that He was drinking with his friends, who were also underage, remember? Everybody's a freshman here. And they'd been drinking heavily all evening. Remember, they were pre-gaming before the party at the track house. And then after midnight at the track house, they went back and kept drinking. It's my theory that one of these friends, or maybe more than one, went to check on John and found him either dying or already deceased. Either way, the person who found him assumed he was dead and told another student or students in their group. And the group panicked, as groups do. Um, A person is smart, a group of people are panicky, flighty, as the saying goes. And they either took his body to the trash chute, which it would be a lot easier for multiple people to conceal carrying that body and pushing it into the trash chute together, than it would be for an individual. Or they took him down the four flights of stairs to the basement. Yes, one individual, a fireman carrying an uh, unconscious person is going to be sus. But I have definitely, in my time, seen people carrying, like a group of people, trying to walk their drunk friend home. And it sometimes looks like Weekend at Bernie's. You're like, is that, are you sure your friend's still alive? So... And honestly, I've seen that happen so many times in college, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't identify that person, usually because I'm drunk myself. I don't know. Now, why would they put him in the dumpster? Well, because they probably assumed that, oh, it's Saturday morning. Someone's going to come empty the dumpster and they'll find his body. Remember, no one knew at the time that the trash compactor was motion activated. Now, there's going to be no blood in the chute if he went down the chute because he wasn't bleeding. He had passed out, quote unquote, and died of alcohol poisoning, respiratory failure. There's no blood with that. Or, like I said, he was carried down by his friends like they were walking him back to his room. And if anyone saw them, they didn't think anything of it because, like, that happens all the time. It is possible that while he was being carried, his necklace became loose and separated from his body while it was being disposed of. And that his friends either forgot about the sneakers in the room because, again, they're drunk. Or they let the dorm room door close behind them and it latched, locking them out of the room and unable to retrieve the sneakers. This is definitely a feature that uh, occurred in the Trenton State rooms that I've been to. 
not impossible. Ah, uh, but wait, you say. His friends at the party all said John didn't appear drunk. So how could he have been that drunk? So, excellent questions. Um, I'm just going to pop my toxicologist hat back on. It's a literal hat, like I said. Um, so as I mentioned a few minutes ago, unless you're a toxicologist or someone who's gone through tips training as a bar server, a law enforcement officer who's been trained in SFSTs, or you're a toxicologist, it is really hard to determine how exactly impaired someone is without having a uh, blood alcohol content information. Especially if you're drunk yourself. Um, there have been many cases where medical doctors didn't even realize how drunk someone was until they got the blood or urine alcohol results back. Uh, so I do not trust his college student friends to know and be able to say, oh, he wasn't that drunk. Like, yeah, he was drunk, but he wasn't that drunk. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. And even if one of them is a toxicology student as a freshman, doubtful, then they were drunk themselves. So their judgment is also impaired. So mm, not going to buy it. Sorry about it. Um, and we need to talk about this person who is not named in any of the information out there who says they saw John in Jane's bed on the night of the disappearance or murder, whichever you want to call it. Um, let's assume for a second that that person truly does believe that they saw John in Jane's bed that night. Our memories are based on our perception. Uh, they're filtered through our mind at the time that the memory is created. Alcohol impairs your judgment at the time that you're drinking it, and your memory is an encoding of your perception at the time. So if you are drunk, your memory is filtered through the perception of a drunk person. Um, to put it in uh, more technical terms, bad data in, bad data out. If you are drunk, your memory is not going to be accurate. Just like if you're high, you're gonna remember stuff a little differently than what actually occurred. And that's not even taking into consideration the way our brain works. My degree is in psychology and I actually specifically studied sensation and perception, uh, specifically inattentional blindness, which involves how we encode uh, memories and how we recognize what's going on around us. If you've ever seen that video where you're supposed to count the people passing the ball back and forth, and then after you're done counting, you're told there was a gorilla in the middle of the video, that is an attentional blindness and it has to do with memory. You don't recall seeing the gorilla for several reasons. The one we're gonna focus on today is the fact that your brain only has so much data processing that it can do. Uh, your eyes also, you blink and you don't realize that you're blind when you're blinking, but every time you blink, you go blind for a split second. What your brain does is it takes the information around you and it fills it in so that you have a consistent stream from memory, even though your memory in reality should be very choppy and it's just kind of filling in bits. It's a bit like if you were trying to DVR a TV show and you know the power goes out and then the power comes back on. You don't know what happened in there, but you can kind of guess where the story was going. Your brain does that all the time. It's doing it right now. Um, in fact, if you go back through several of my videos, I have essentially done in inattentional blindness experiments on you. I have put things in this frame and then taken them out a split second later. No one notices because you're not focused on it. You're focused on what's going on in the video. So this person being drunk, their memory's not that good. They may be experiencing um, a fragmentary blackout. That happens at about a 0.09 or higher blood alcohol content where your brain essentially just starts skipping all over a place like an old fashioned record. It's not getting everything, it's blacking out here and there. And you can't tell if you're experiencing blackouts. You can't tell if someone else is experiencing blackouts. So 
it is very possible that this person who saw John didn't see him at 3 a.m. in bed, didn't see him at all that night, and their brain just filled in the details. Like maybe they peeked into Jane's room, didn't see anybody and said, nope, Jane's there because their brain filled it in because they're drunk, they're missing parts of their memory, brain fills it in. Or it's possible they didn't even look in the room that night, but on a previous night, they did look in the room and see John on the bed and their brain just filled it in because that is how our brains work. Our brains are very imperfect computers like that. So just, eyewitness, first of all, we have to understand when we're talking true crime, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable because of what I just talked about, plus other factors with how the human brain works. When you add alcohol, it gets totally unreliable. Never trust the recollection of a drunk person. Okay. So that's why it's possible that John was there in Jane's bed at 3 a.m. But this unnamed person is not the most reliable narrator. So I don't know if I want to take his or her word on it, first of all. Okay. Now, hold on, you say. We're done with brain science. I'm gonna put my toxicology hat away there. We're done talking about alcohol for now. Um, wait, you say. What about the necklace in the sneakers? They found the necklace outside the dumpster, but they found the sneakers in the bedroom. How did that happen? Well, if we go with the family's theory that he was murdered by a crazy ex-student, then he, maybe he was murdered in bed, but how there was no evidence of a struggle. It, the bed was partially unmade. I feel like if there was a struggle, like he was being strangled, then the bed would have been totally tossed or if he was stabbed or shot, obviously blood would have been in there and the roommate might have been like, oh shit, someone died here tonight, right? It's possible if we're going with the murdered theory, either drug deal gone wrong that he witnessed or the ex-student who was off their medication, uh, it's possible that he got up after 3 a.m. before 10 a.m. to use the bathroom or something and walked in his bare feet. Uh, no college student that I know who went to Trenton State would have done that because the floors were nasty but maybe he did because he's drunk. That is absolutely a possibility. But, I mean, just because his shoes are there doesn't mean that he necessarily slept there. Uh, again, let's let's say that our, I totally saw him and closed the door behind him. Narrator is an unreliable narrator. Maybe John went to go to go to sleep and then was taking off his clothes as you do. It takes off his necklace, which I always take my jewelry off before I go to sleep. And is like, ah, oh, fuck that bitch for not wanting to date me. And not want to break up with her boyfriend. Or, oh my God, I'm so sad. This girl doesn't want me. It's a symbol of that. He goes, chucks it down the shaft. That makes sense. Then, because emotional lability is a thing that happens when you're drunk, he goes, oh crap, I didn't really mean to do that. And goes running down to the basement to climb in totally a possibility and explains away both the necklace which as I've mentioned before was lightweight would have bounced possibly off the dumpster edge and onto the floor and also explains how he got down there without shimmying down the garbage chute die hard style but there's also the possibility that if in the scenario that I'm proposing they find him dead or dying and almost dead and they think he's dead because they're also drunk then as multiple people are trying to move this body around the necklace is going to come off it might even come off in the shoot itself and again being lightweight boom 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 bounces out of the chute and onto the floor rather than going straight down into the dumpster like john's body did so again why would the sneakers be left though mm. If they're just moving the body, whoever is moving his body out of the room, they're probably not gonna stop and pick up sneakers. They're just, they're more concerned about moving this 175 pound body. As I have mentioned before, at least the dorms that I've stayed in, in Trenton State, the door, you have to prop it open because if you don't take your keys, because otherwise it's gonna close and latch and lock. They take the body, move it to the dumpster, come back, door's locked can't get in. Oh well, 
they're drunk, they're not probably thinking, they're not probably too concerned about this whole, oops, his sneakers are there. There's no evidence of what happened. They're still in the clear about the underage drinking. And again, they still think his body will be found. Someone will come clean the dumpster out tomorrow. Not realizing, A, dumpster doesn't get cleaned out till Monday. B, other students are going to be throwing stuff down the into the dumpster. He's going to get buried. And C, not knowing that the trash compactor has just compacted him. So, there's nothing in the evidence that points to any one theory being correct. And I need to reiterate that my theory of the alcohol poisoning, accidental death, and then, oh crap, we're all drunk and we don't want to get in trouble, we need to get rid of this body, is just a theory. It is not based on anything that the police have that has not been released publicly. This is just based on the news articles that included publicly available information. And that was when I was researching this case, something could have happened in the last two weeks since I started research that suggests something different. So huge grain of salt. And if you're watching this after October of 2021, there could be a huge break in the case that makes everything I've said irrelevant or moot. Okay. Now, I need to point out that this is still an open case in the state of New Jersey. So any details that have not been shared have not been shared because they are relevant to the case. And at any time, these theories of how he disappeared, how he died, and how he ended up in the dumpster could be proven or disproven. If a toxicology test had been performed, and we don't know because it has not been released, then that could prove or disprove my theory of the case, or at least give weighted evidence toward my theory of the case. Um, a point to note, if the toxicology ever does come out, put the toxicologist hat back on here. An important note, if toxicology evidence is ever released and there is a BAC involved, a couple of caveats with that BAC. First of all, um, we talked earlier about what's known as ADME, how the body uh, absorbs drug or processes drugs, um, absorption, distribution, metabolization, elimination. That process stops when you die. Uh, with alcohol, in general, where you where a dead body is when it's found is generally going to be how bad the blood alcohol was at the time of death. Uh, some drugs do redistribute throughout the body. Uh, there's settling that has to be taken into account. But with alcohol, if we get a good blood sample, that's pretty much going to be what the blood alcohol was at the time of death. But, important but here, as a body decomposes, the blood alcohol will rise because the body's natural decomposition does produce alcohol, ethanol specifically. So the longer you decompose, the higher that blood alcohol is going to be. Now, it's not going to take you from a completely sober zero to a 0.4. That's not how this works. But you can increase by a 0.01 or a 0.02 or even a 0.03, depending on how long it's been decomposing. So it could put him into a different stage of drunkenness. And it's so you have to really take those results with a grain of salt. If we see something like a 0.03, it's there is a possibility he was sober at the time. But if we see a 0.3, there was no possibility that he was sober at the time. He was pretty damn drunk. It's possible also that there will never be toxicology results because his body was sitting outside in Pennsylvania in the middle of the spring. If you're not familiar with uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, around the Philadelphia area in the spring, sometimes we can get snow and sometimes we can get a heat wave. It's usually pretty warm. We usually have like flowers and stuff coming up. It's, it's pretty, and it's, it's humid. The best way I can describe New Jersey, Pennsylvania at that time of year is moist. And it's kind of perfect for decomposition. So there is the possibility that after three weeks and after being pretty badly mangled, there's no way to get a good 
blood or urine sample for toxicology or even a vitreous sample. Uh, we, there may be no toxicology results because there were no available samples for that. Yes, yeah, sometimes you can take a sample after someone's been decomposed for quite some time and run toxicology results on it. But for blood alcohol, that's exceptionally difficult. It's not like it's arsenic or um, some other, you know, poison of that sort. It's, you know, it, it's a little bit more... Uh, delicate, let's say. So we may never know how drunk he actually was. There may be no toxicology that gives us a blood alcohol, a reliable blood alcohol. So that's a caveat. Head off. All right. So again, the, my theory, the death from alcohol poisoning and the cover-up by some drunken college students is just one theory that works with the toxicology evidence that I've, circumstantial toxicology evidence, we have obviously no direct evidence. Um, the other theory that works really well with this, of course, is the angry tossed necklace theory. Um, something that happens in when you're drunk is called emotional lability. You kind of go from happy to sad to angry, like you're, you have no control over your emotions and they kind of just fluctuate rapidly and almost without, I want to say almost without being uh, triggered by anything. You just, you know, a person's very happy and all of a sudden they'll just get pissed off about something. It's called emotional lability. Happens. Um, so that if he's in the lower levels of drunkenness, again, like the one drink per hour, then it's completely possible that the, that, that actually fits the drunken necklace theory personally. You get higher than that. I think the alcohol poisoning theory fits well. Um, or just some other kind of death by accident. You know, someone accidentally killed him. But we can't even say that it's a murder. We just don't know, and we don't have the evidence to prove it. It seems most likely to me, alcohol poisoning or the necklace throwaway theory, but I can understand why the family wouldn't want to believe the necklace throwaway theory, because that's pretty grim. And again, anything is possible. It is it's very possible that there was a manic ex-student running around who killed him. And even it's even possible that that manic ex-student also killed a student 30 years earlier and had just been running around as the serial killer of Trenton State. Highly improbable, but not impossible. But because there's alcohol involved in both John and the friends that were supposed to be with him that night, because of the delay in reporting the body, the delay in the police investigation, thanks campus cops, and just because of the delay in discovering his body for three weeks, there is a possibility that we will never know what happened to John Piacco. Hopefully for the family, the case will eventually be resolved one way or the other. And if there was a person or persons responsible for John Fiacco's death, hopefully they will be brought to justice. But that's all we have for now. What's your theory on what happened to John Fiacco? Was it an accident, you know, death by misadventure? Was it cold-blooded murder? Was it some kind of crazy serial killer that's been stalking the campus for 30 years? Or do you have a completely different theory? Was it, tell me, please leave, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think happened. I'd love to talk to you about this. And if you have any questions about, you know, memory and how it relates to toxicology, leave them below. I will try to answer any question that you have. Again, if you enjoyed the episode, me, please make sure to let me know. Based on your comments, I will either continue this as a once a month video going forward in November, or I'll just do it for spooky season and we'll do no more after that. Um, just let me know. Make sure you hit subscribe. Give me a like. And of course, if you enjoyed it, please share the video with your friends. As I've mentioned before, I don't have any sponsorship deals. So if you enjoyed this and you'd like to contribute to more frequent videos, please consider joining the Patreon, which has little mini videos that don't go onto YouTube, or consider buying a passion planner. I use passion planner as one of the two planners in my life. I love their product. 
you can either hit the link in the description or type the link in here and use the code Elizabeth10. It'll take 10% off of your purchase, including if the purchase is marked down. So if you have a sale where they're marked down to like eight bucks each, it'll take another 10% off of that. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe and I will see you next week for a regular video and next week for a planning on crime video. Bye guys.